Hey, hey, this is Miss Cooper. We're here with part three of chapter seven. I want to remind you of our objective for this chapter, wherein we are analyzing the emergence and expansion of the Industrial Revolution. We are explaining the social, geographic, economic, and political implications that resulted from it. Uh, the examples of those implications include imperialism, which in response to imperialism comes nationalistic movements and resistance. So this is where we are with this chapter. We've done a lot of uh, conversating uh, about the area, the area of Asia. A lot of our notes this week, a lot of our videos and the information that we're taking in is dealing specifically with China, Japan, there's Korea here, there are the rivers that are in, in the Asian area region. We call all of these places that are Asian, we call that the Far East. If we haven't made that verbiage clear, that that region of the world is called the Far East. So we're going to go to your document that you received on yesterday, which was your outline. And I'm going to discuss briefly the questions that I wanted you to answer. If you did not get to answer those, please, please, please answer them today. Okay, because all I'm going to do is ask you for a certain number. It looks like there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven questions. And uh, probably it's definitely six of these seven questions will be on your week seven quiz. So the first question dealt with Chinese goods that were highly sought by European traders. For the most part, they were looking for tea and silk. And that is uh, on kind of your first page. You, you should probably go and annotate your document if you have printed it out. If not printed it out, write notes down about these, these answers. Tea and silk. Okay, that, that's, those are the goods are pr primarily sought by Europeans. The consequences of the First and Second Opium Wars. Um, the, the highlights or the, the bold headings that deal with each one of those, the information is there in this document. But the first Opium War went from 1839 to 1842, and it ended with the Treaty of Nanking. Every war ends with some type of piece of paper, a treaty of some sort that says, here's what you do, here's who won, here's who lost, here's what we get, here's what you don't get anymore, or here's what you have to pay. The tr a treaty. There's a treaty at the end of almost every war, and it's important that you know the terms of the treaty so that you can see how it affects the rest of that area's future. Uh -huh. So the Treaty of Nanking was signed in 1842. It allowed for four additional ports. Okay, We're talking about British ports, ports where the British could come in, bring their ships, sell their stuff, and not be bothered. They can do it. Nobody's going to bother. Okay, um, The four ports were Amoy, Ningpo, Fuchao, and Shanghai. Okay, Make sure you can recognize those. Uh, also, most importantly, British control over Hong Kong. And the British maintained control over Hong Kong until 1997. So that may not be spelled out in the notes, but I need you to know that it is Hong Kong that remained under British control until 1997. From 1842 to 1997. That's a long time. So that's the first Opium War. Uh, they, China also had to pay an indemnity, which means some money. And they were limited to a 5% tariff. So any of the goods that were being exported from China and imported into Britain, the, the tariff couldn't, it couldn't have a high t price tag. You're not going to give us anything expensive. You're going to give us everything really cheap. 5% is the most that you can charge for a tax. A tariff is a tax. Um, the second Opium War from 1856 to 1860, um, Prior to the Second Opium War, the concept of extraterritoriality is a component that the Chinese do not like. Uh, they don't like it because extraterritoriality means if you come to our country and break one of our laws, you have to be tried in a court amongst your peers, as in your people are going to judge you for what you did wrong in our country. So that's why the Chinese did not like that, because if they, they felt like if you come to our country, we should judge you for breaking the law instead of you judging yourself because you don't think you did anything wrong. You're the one that came over here. So this is why that was a problem. They 
uh, again, extraterritoriality says you're tried in their own courts and under their own laws. So the second opium war resulted in China opening up even more ports to European trade. They legalized the, the trafficking of opium. Uh, they protected Christian missionaries. This is all, these are all results of the second opium war, okay? Uh, all foreign vessels could navigate the Yangtze River. Okay, that, that goes into a question that's not spelled out in here. The, there's a question about the open door policy. And the open door policy kind of talks about freely. You should be able to travel that river over there and go get and do whatever you want to do. Um, Russia's border extended to the Amur River. Then your, that's the question about the open door policy, being able to freely go along those rivers. But I, I'm probably not going to put that question on your quiz because it's ambiguous. The Boxer Rebellion. This is the group of people, the patriotic, harmonious fists guys, these people that did not like foreigners and were extremely violent and were literally beating people up. The Boxer Rebellion happened in 1900. Uh, this was Chinese people who were resenting foreign influence. They called themselves the Order of the Patriotic Harmonious Fists. That's literally what they called themselves. They demanded that foreigner, all foreigners leave China. They killed people. They vandalized property. Um, it was just ridiculous. But either way, this was their response to imperialism. Okay, the European powers coming into different parts of Asia, the, Ch the Asian people resented this, specifically here in China. This is where this rebellion took place. Um, the Euro European imperialists, Americans, and Japanese put the rebellion down. So the foreigners put the rebellion down. China ended up paying $333 million in damages and had to permit military forces in Peking. Mm -hmm. They said, well, now you got to let your military come over here. Y'all want to come over here beating people up? You want to come over here terrorizing and vandalizing? Uh, you know, we come here, we, you know, we came here and you started vandalizing and terrorizing us. But remember why they were doing that. They were doing that because the Europeans came with a lot of negative influences. Christianity was not so negative, but it seemed to be a guise to a disguise to get people into Asia. Oh, we're missionaries. We're coming to give you the Bible. You know, people were shady and people didn't know exactly, you know, is that real? Are you really here to, you know, help us? Because we saw some negative things. We saw opium just get brought on right after the Bible. So at the end of the day, the Boxer Rebellion was a response to the European imperialism. Um, and the 21 demands, J Japan, now that's maybe another one I might not put on there because I'm probably just going to ask you more questions about what did Japan want, okay? And because I'm running out of time on this video, I don't want to be on here too long. Japan has uh, several things that they, they want uh, to make China a Japanese protectorate, okay? Um, the action was condemned and stopped by other leading world powers. Um, China wanted to abolish extraterritoriality, but it didn't work. Japan gained a mandate over most of Germany's Asian possessions and rights. That's something that Japan definitely wanted. Their 21 demands are in 1915, okay? that's It's in the notes on page 6. So, yes, there will be things from that list that you want to make sure that you can recognize. Um, then the Sun Yat-sen Three Principles. So Sun Yat-sen, the principle of Min Kwan, which is democracy, the people are sovereign. The second principle of Min Zhu, which is nationalism and end to foreign imperialism. And principle three, the principle of Min Sheng, livelihood, economic development, industrialization, land reform, and social welfare elements of progressivism and socialism. Those are the three principles of Sun Yat-sen before his death in 1925. And then the area of China that remained under British control until 1997 is Hong Kong. And even if that's not spelled out for you in your notes, I definitely want to make sure that you know that will be a quiz question. So with that being said, that's the biggest piece of this document for this week, Chapter 7. That's the whole outline kind of giving you the details about what was going on there. So make sure you watch the next video, take the facts, write your notes, listen to the instructions. Thank you for being here. Have a great day.